Too Much Information is a production of iHeartRadio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Too Much Information, the show that brings you the secret histories and little-known fascinating facts and figures behind your favorite movies, music, TV shows, and more. We're your two Janus Ians of jabbering inanities. I'm Alex Heigl. And I'm Jordan Runtog. And Jordan, today we're talking about one of the lodestars of Audie's entertainment, the Ionic, or is it Doric, column that propped up BuzzFeed <laughs> quizzes for decades and continues to dominate the conversation on social media every October 3rd. That's right, <laughs> folks. Welcome back to Mummuary. We're talking about 2017's The Mummy, starring Tom Cruise. I'm just kidding. We're talking about being girls. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you brought that mummy bit back. Mummy wary. Mummy wary 2023. Come on. And then next it'll be Mummy 59, which I think is Christopher Lee. Is that the Hammer Horror one? I think anyway, so. Anyway, yep. it's neither here nor there. Let's get down to brass tacks. Can I, Jordan, can I be honest with you? Uh, always. <laughs> I don't remember a time in my life that Mean Girls wasn't in it. I know mathematically that it had to have happened, but this movie has been in my skull since I saw it. First, thanks to. The girl I was in love with in high school who made Hugo Glenn Coco her AIM screen name. And then... I, she could have gotten a lot of money for that screen name, I bet. Wow. Well, maybe on Twitter, but not on AIM. No one's selling those. Anyway, um, and then by the time we were professionals in the content industrial minds... <laughs> this was like every BuzzFeed quiz, like, which mean girls are lying are you? Which blah, 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 de blue. And every October 3rd, it comes back. And every Wednesday. Every Wednesdays. Yeah. So now none of that short sells the fact that it rules. It's a yeah. great movie. It's whip smart. It's funny. It's got a good core to it. It's got great performances. So I just want to get that out of the way. But I am, I've had it. It's the stairway to heaven of Audie's <laughs> co- teen comedies. I just tend to prefer 30 Rock at this point. If I'm looking for that unique Tina Fey snark, I'm going for 30 Rock. But it's such a fascinating document of its time. Great Lindsay Lohan before the fall. Uh, oh. And then this d- diz- sorry, Lindsay. dizzying assemblage of 20-somethings masquerading as high schoolers. You got your Rachel McAdams. You got your Lizzie Kaplan, Lacey Chabert, Amanda Seyfried, Tim Meadows. <laughs> Who is in his 20s making... No, I'm kidding. Jordan, what are your thoughts on Mean Girls? I mean, I love it. My main memory of this movie is when it came out, and it was like Star Wars or something at my high school. Everyone I knew (laughs) went to see this movie the weekend it came out, and I am really hard-pressed to think of a movie that had that kind of impact on my social circle in that era. Not the Matrix movies, not the Lord of the Rings movies, not the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, not even the Harry Potter series. And my memory of the opening weekend dovetails with, uh, appropriately enough, a humiliating high school incident of my own. So it'll always be fused. <laughs> Let's go over it. to that that yeah, corner of the yeah. show for you. Uh, it's a little discursive, but if you'll, if you'll indulge me. Um, there was this really cool thing that my high school did every year. They hosted something called the Indie, which was the student-run independent arts festival. And one night each May, just before graduation, the school would turn over to the auditorium and give kids a platform to showcase pretty much whatever art they wanted to make. Bands would play, people would dance, people would show their short films, perform their plays. It was really cool. And there was a lot of talent at my high school. My friend Chris Fleming, who's a, a brilliant comedian of some renowned through uh, his work on YouTube and his stand-up specials. Uh, He was in the grade above me, and he was on the indie board, and he performed at it. And it was just really cool to see the stuff that kids were making. Anyway, I went to the indie my freshman year of high school in 2003, and I met this girl. Great, wonderful person. We had a deep connection. Sadly, it did not work out for reasons that were 100% my fault, and I was deeply, deeply deeply heartbroken. Uh, And I channeled this heartbreak into my first play, which was performed at the Indie my sophomore year. And, you know, it was the one year anniversary of my meeting this girl and I knew she was going to be there. And I don't know. I thought it was going to be this big, grand, romantic gesture to win her back. Uh, Can I tell you something? Yeah. That's weird. I know. I know. And, and, (laughs) And it didn't work either, which is, yeah. 
I could have told you that. I know, but when I was 15, 16, I, yeah. I, no, basically, no, it's the exact gesture I would expect you as a 15 yeah. or 16 year old. No, man. yeah, I mean, and yeah. this person, again, she's a beautiful, wonderful person. I'm sure it wasn't that bad of a play. No, it wasn't. I mean, I mean, again, this person is a beautiful, wonderful person, and I was slash am a lunatic, so I take 100% of responsibility <laughs> here. She has an amazing family now. We DM on occasion. It's great. At that time, not so much. I was sad. I was in the write-a-play stage of grieving. So anyway, I had scheduled rehearsals for my play the Friday that Mean Girls was released, which apparently I'm told is April 30th, 2004. And essentially every single cast member of my play came up to me at some point during the day and said, sorry, we can't make rehearsal. We're going to see Mean Girls tonight. And I, <laughs> and I just remember thinking, wow, that's like, really cool i'd love to write something someday that was so smart and funny that all my friends would be excited to see it you know it was a powerful little moment for a, a heartbroken love struck 16 year old and then a few years later i was at nyu studying dramatic writing and all of the students and faculty absolutely worship 30 rock and we used to like dissect the scripts and examine the jokes and the plots so all this to say all respect to tina fey and this incredible movie I'm well aware that the anecdote was more about me than it was about her, but she made a very big impression on me at a very impressionable age. So I will always have a soft spot for her. Well, f yeah. <laughs> well, from the movie's roots in a book authored by a black belt political scientist to the role swapping that went on among the film's leads to the elaborate editing trickery that was needed for that four-way phone call scene. Here's everything you didn't know about Mean Girls. Mean Girls has its genesis in a book called Queen Bees and Wannabes, Helping Your Daughter Survive Clicks, Gossip, Boyfriends, and Other Realities of Adolescence by a woman named Rosalind Wiseman. Wiseman grew up in Washington, D.C., the oldest of three children. In a 2002 People Mag profile, she said that while outwardly she was a, quote, pearls and tennis skirt wearing happy girl, she was so concerned with maintaining her place as part of the in-crowd that she stayed in a relationship with a boy who was considered the catch of the school for four years, even though he was physically abusive to her. Oh, God. To prove you belong, she told the magazine, you can do incredibly stupid things. Her family and friends never had a clue. And then she goes away to college. She goes to Occidental College in Los Angeles, and she gets into doing martial arts. She gets into doing the Korean uh, karate offshoot Tang Soo Do, breaks up with a guy, Hopefully beats his ass. That wasn't in the people profile, but that'd be great. Uh, Mary's the guy that she took karate, that he introduced her to, Tang Soo Do. Graduates with a degree in political science in 1991 and a second degree black belt in Tang Soo Do. And uh, they start a martial arts school in Washington, D.C. That rules. Hell yeah. I think for legal reasons, she couldn't be like, I beat the living <laughs> out of that guy. But it, I was really hoping she did. Um... But she and her husband noticed that the girls in their self-defense class were coming to them more with questions about their personal lives than, say, punching. And so they pivoted and established something called the Empower Program that uh, basically was kind of a traveling workshop and seminar giving, class giving business, taught teens how to stand up for themselves and build more positive relationships. Focusing on interpersonal relationships amongst, some, amongst their peer groups with stuff like Apologies Day. Uh, these seminars, and then eventually the book that sprung from them, were packed with terms that fans of the movie will instantly find recognizable, like Alpha Girls, RMGs, which is really mean girls, Queen Bees, Wannabes, Messengers, uh, Bankers, which is someone who collects information and uses it later to their advantage, which Tina Fey told the New York Times in 2004 that was her archetype. <laughs> uh, what are you, Jordan? Uh, I'm probably also a banker. I have a question for you about Apologies Day. That seems to kind of be antithetical to the whole black belt. <laughs> I guess it means like apologize to people. It's like a coming clean thing. Okay. Almost like I don't know. I didn't read the book. <laughs> what do you want from me, Run Talk? Uh, um, in that in that interview, uh, she mentions Heathers, which is funny because that's not the first time this will come up in connection mm. with Mean Girls. She says uh, in this interview with the New York Times Magazine uh, in 2002, she describes Heathers as pretty true to life with respect to her dealings with teenage girls. 
There's a great quote from Rosalind Wiseman's book that sort of gives you the idea of the tone and the message of it. You may feel that it's not worth making a federal case out of not getting invited to a birthday party or letting your daughter blow off one friend for another, but these aren't trivial issues. They lay the groundwork for girls faking their feelings, pretending to be someone they're not, pleasing others at their own expense, or otherwise sacrificing self-esteem and authenticity. Interviewed about the film in 2014, Wiseman said that much of what Tina Fey put in the film was close to her work, minus the trust fall scene. She <laughs> told The Wire, I do not do trust falls. I've never done trust falls. I will never do trust falls. I just remember when I saw the movie for the first time being like, Tina, I do not do that. But other elements of the movie came out of conversations she had with Tina. Rosalind Wiseman said, Tina came down and hung out with me. The things that were surprising to me were things that I sort of set off the cuff walking around. I said to her, walking around my neighborhood, the way I look at this is I look at it like a watering hole where you've got predators. They're hanging out and they're looking at the animals that are drinking water and they're not sure if they're going to attack them or not. And that's the way I look at group dynamics with young people. <laughs> she really she has a way with words. Yeah. Way with an image. <laughs> I remember seeing that mall scene, she continued, and thinking, Jesus, I said this to her. That made me laugh hysterically. I remember thinking, gosh, I just said that to her off the cuff. And then she takes that and makes an incredible scene out of it. But overall, she was extremely happy with the way Tina Fey handled her material. She said, I wouldn't change anything. I had turned down a lot of other people on making Queen Bees a movie, and it was an easy no to all those other people. But it was an easy yes to Tina. I thought this was a smart woman who was funny, who sort of had my sensibility. So why wouldn't I? Both Tina and I seem to be trying to carve out a space of how to give women a voice in public. So it's pretty cool to have a collaboration between two people who say, yeah, let's work together to do this because you're smart, you're funny, I think you're going to do a good job, let's try it. She was happy about the creative side, but less so the financials. Ain't it always the case. <laughs> yeah. In 2021, Wiseman went on the record on Artie Shahani's Art of Power podcast on WBEZ Chicago with her dissatisfaction the way that the money side of her Mean Girls deal shook out. She explained that she received the initial payout of 440 grand for her deal with Paramount Pictures, which is doesn't seem like an amount to sneeze at, but you know that's pretty standard for adaptation rights for a bestseller. But then she said she got nothing else from the deal, which goes against her contract because she uh, said that Paramount promised her 5% of the net proceeds from Mean Girls. And that film pulled in about $130 million at the worldwide box office. But she said on the podcast that because of the classic Hollywood accounting, she was told by the studio the film was not profitable and that therefore she was not entitled to any further payments. <sighs> This has happened on a few films we've talked about on this show, uh, including some of the Star Wars prequels. It's actually Return of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi, yes. Lucasfilm says it has not made money. <laughs> <laughs> well, on a similar note, I like to quote this little nugget from the Hollywood Accounting Wikipedia page. Yes, there's a whole Wikipedia page about these questionable financial practices. A Warner Brothers receipt was leaked online in 2010 showing that the hugely successful movie Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix from 2007 ended up as a $167 million loss on paper, despite the fact that it grossed nearly a billion dollars. How do they? I still don't understand how they're able to fudge the numbers so much on paper. I think half of it is just being like... We have more money for lawyers than you do. And like, do you want to make this a court case or do you want to take us at our word and our specious accounting? Uh, okay. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, Wiseman added that she was hurt when she heard Mean Girls was being developed into a Broadway musical by Faye and her husband, Jeff Richmond, because at the time she signed the deal, quote, there is no way for me to know that a musical was in the future. There's no way to know that. So I was signing away rights I didn't know that I had or was even up for. Lastly, and perhaps most damningly, she claimed that she asked Faye to vouch for additional money for her for these rights with Paramount, and Faye allegedly promised to help her and even go to Lorne Michaels, and then ghosted her. You certainly don't want to admit it out loud because you don't want the world to look at this and then create some meme about, like, mean women and mean girls and dismissing and superficializing the work because there is this inconsistency in real life, Weissman said. And she continued... Why was I so silent when I was literally telling boys and girls all of this time to speak out when they've experienced an abuse of power? Because like, just like everybody else, I got into a situation where I was intimidated and felt overwhelmed and that silenced me. Oh, so that's sad. kind of a bummer. Yeah. That's why you always get 
you don't ever get net. You always angle for a chunk of the gross. But honestly, the fact that she was even able to, for a first time uh, author, having your book adapted into a, a movie, that's, even the fact that she was able to get points promised to her is something. I don't know, but not thinking about like potential TV shows down the road or musicals, yeah. like that seems like a rookie mistake. I know it was Another classic, years ago. Yeah. But... Rosalind Wiseman, you receive a B minus in our, <laughs> in, the, in the TMI business <laughs> smarts class. <laughs> Just punching this woman while she's oh, down. Yeah, this is, that's, that's tough. I don't <laughs> like that. Uh, but. Now let's uh, take it to the Tina Fey side of things. Um, she wrote the treatment to this when she was still working at SNL. Um, she told Savannah Guthrie on the Today Show in 2019, I saw this article in the New York Times about a woman named Roz Wiseman who had written this book. I was like, I want to make a movie of that. Talking to IGN in 2012, Faye said, I had read this article about Rosalind in the New York Times magazine, and so then I went to Lorne Michaels, and I think between Lorne and Paramount together, we got an advanced copy of Rosalind's book, and I read it, and then I called Rosalind on the phone, and I introduced myself, and I sort of asked for her hand in marriage. <laughs> so that's just funny, because she is talking about the New York Times magazine article I cited earlier. I love it when I can find, like, the exact thing that sparked some creative work. I'm calling it. There can't have been that many from 2002, yeah, right? Yeah, oh. People had called about turning it into a movie or a TV show, and I had no problem turning them down because it was always something cheesy, Rosalind Wiseman told the New York Times. For their oral history of the film in 2014, there are a lot of oral histories of Mean Girls, is what I learned. They were trying to make it about me. You're so inspirational. And then Tina called. I didn't know who she was. I had a new baby. I had a book coming out. I wasn't watching SNL. But I knew it was important to her that it was not going to be stupid. From the time I said yes until the time it came out was about 18 months. Wow, that's fast. That's, yeah, it's a crazy turnaround time. Uh, when I first pitched it to Lorne, I was thinking I'd like to write a movie about what they call relational aggression among girls, Faye told Vulture in 2014 for their oral history. He was like, okay, but could they also still have cool cars and cool clothes? <laughs> Which is a very Lorne Michaels yeah. thing to ask. And I was like, oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> You know Lauren's favorite line in this movie? Talk to me again and I'll kick your ass. <laughs> also a very Lauren Michaels line. Yeah. So this script for Mean Girls was Tina Fey's first, and she wrote it completely by herself without the studio bringing in any more established writers to punch it up. She later told Savannah Guthrie, that was really rare, especially at that time. This awesome woman named Sherry Lansing, who ran Paramount Pictures at the time, she never took the script away from me. And she... Also admitted when she was talking to the New York Times in 2004, it was kind of a bonehead thing to do on my part for my first screenplay to try to adapt a non-fiction, non-narrative book. I had to make up the whole story. I mean, it's not Chinatown, but just to keep a story moving <laughs> forward was all new to me. I did a million drafts, and I did the thing everybody does. I read Sid Field, who wrote a book called The Foundations of Screenwriting, and I used my little index cards, which is a you know screenwriting one-on-one technique where you write a scene on an index card, and you have to be able to fit what you want the scene to actually achieve on the index card. You know, if it can't fit on there, then you got to distill it down into its essence. You know what I mean? Like, you got to be able to sum up what you want to occur in that scene scene on the screen and what it's meant to do to move the plot forward and it's got to be able to fit on an index card it's a good approach unless you're someone hmm. like me who talks too much and writes too much <laughs> it's useful aside from pulling in material from her conversations with rosalind wiseman tina fey added in bits to the script from her own life she told ign i did have a health teacher that was kind of like the health teacher in this movie like a really poorly informed health teacher and i had some of katie's storyline with aaron in terms of her obsessive pursuit of him, that was sort of like the fumbling obsessive pursuit that I was trying to do in high school. It never worked out for me. You and me both, Tina. <laughs> yeah, she did mention if she uh, she wrote a play for anyone. I want to clarify, the play wasn't like, I wasn't like calling this girl out in front of the entire school. It had nothing, like, I mean, there's no, there, it really. Because I'm imagining the musical that Charlie writes in uh, It's Always Sunny, where he casts, himself, you know, he casts himself as a little boy or a, Needing, or no, he doesn't cast himself. He writes her as a... As, anyway. You know oh, no, I mean? yeah, Did, no. Have you seen that? I, I was, it wasn't like the day man? No, absolutely not. No, no, no. It has is it had... No. It was... <laughs> It was a public apology. It, it, it had nothing to do. It, I, I did not publicly shame her. No. No, I didn't say you were shaming her. The um, it was an apology. No, no, no. It was. It was a 
That's almost worse. No, it wasn't an apology. It was... What was it called? Uh, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> Not a good sign. I thought this was really it's all right, clever. It's all right. It's all right. Tell, no, no, don't, 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 don't. Venmo us five dollars, and I will tell you the name of Jordan's <laughs> high school apology play to the girl he was. It wasn't. It wasn't an apology. <laughs> I'm um, okay. It's okay. You have pictures of me with dreadlocks <laughs> <laughs> and a fretless bass. Somehow like. more cancelable, which really shouldn't be, but. <laughs> Also, the moment where Regina says to Katie, oh, you think you're really pretty? Oh, so you agree? That happened to Tina Fey, <laughs> which is, yeah, girls have been weird to each other since time immemorial. Uh, <laughs> Tina Fey also has a personal connection to the line when Regina compliments this girl walking by on her skirt and then says to Katie, that is the ugliest effing skirt I've ever seen in my life. And Tina Fey later explained to blackfilm.com, my mom has this habit that if she sees a lady in a really ugly hat or a glittery sweatshirt, she'll go, I love your shirt. And I'll say, Mom, that's really mean. And she'll say, clearly she wanted someone to notice that shirt. She picked it out. It has a huge teddy bear on it. Hmm. Uh, while people have speculated that Lowen's character's name, Katie, C-A-D-Y, is a tribute to suffragette Elizabeth Katie Stanton, it was also the name of Faye's college roommate at University of Virginia. I tried to use real names in writing because it's just easier, Tina Fey told Entertainment Weekly. My older brother's good friend is Glenn Coco. He's a film editor in Los Angeles, and I imagine it's a pain in the butt for him. She also named the character of Shane Oman, who is Regina's boyfriend after Aaron, after a stage manager at Second City. Janice Ian, obviously the name of a real-life singer-songwriter. She was the first ever musical guest uh, on SNL. She is oh, best yeah. known for the Teen Girl in Pain anthem uh, at 17 which is one of the many songs Tina Fey sings in a, in 30 Rock. <laughs> I heard she also based her character on uh, Kelly Osbourne, circa 2003. That was the, hmm. the Janice Ian character in this okay. movie. Ms. Norbury is named after Fey's high school German teacher, and while she cast herself as the character, she told the New York Times to combat the perception that women can't do math. She also admitted to stealing lesson plans from a friend's boyfriend who is a calculus teacher in the Bronx. Just to uh, help script the math parts. <laughs> the first draft of Mean Girls, Tina told the New York Times, was, quote, for sure R-rated. I was trying to write a truthful high school experience, so there was a lot of swearing and there was some more sex. John Goldman, the guy at Paramount when I was writing my first draft, he told me, write it the way you want to write it. Don't worry about swearing. This is Tina talking to IGN. That was wise because that was my first draft, so it was R-rated. Regina was swearing like a sailor. Just terrible language, and it kind of got out of my system. Maybe coming from TV, I just needed to break free of my chains for a second. And then, by the time we got the second and third draft, it was like, you know, we really do want to try to get a PG-13 rating for this movie. Because I wanted girls to be able to see the movie. I wasn't trying to, like, dumb it down necessarily and write it for little girls, but I didn't want them to not be able to see it. Especially with Lindsay in the movie, because Lindsay had a lot of fans. And so we went through and cleaned it up. Yeah, the other thing, the uh, the director, Mark Waters, says that what happened was, one of the things that happened was Freaky Friday had come out and been a huge hit. Oh, and, this, yeah. and Paramount was like, oh, this has to be PG-13 now, because you can't have all the people who like Lindsay Lohan from being uh, in, you know. A, a, a Disney adjacent a movie. A Disney thing, yeah, suddenly turning the air blue. Um, <laughs> among the changes that they made to the script were substituting butter your muff, the, the, uh, I guess you call it an idiom, innuendo. Uh, among yes. the changes were substituting the innuendo butter your muffin for the original, which was pop your cherry, and, uh, substituting made out with a frozen hot dog for masturbated with a frozen hot dog. Uh, director Mark Waters still remembers, though, they ended up in a standoff with the MPAA over a completely different and much more innocuous part. The line in the sand that I drew, he told Vulture, was a joke about the wide-set vagina. The ratings board said, we can't give you a PG-13 unless you cut that line. We ended up playing the card that the ratings board was sexist because Anchorman had just come out, and Ron Burgundy had an erection in one scene, and that was PG-13. We told them, you're only saying this because it's a girl, and she's talking about a part of her anatomy. There's no sexual context whatsoever, and to say this is restrictive to an audience of girls is demeaning to all women. And eventually, they had to back down. Stephanie Drummond, the actress who plays the subject of that line, told Cosmopolitan UK, 
I remember they called my agent to see if I'd be comfortable saying the vagina line, and I said, sure. <laughs> it became this big thing over time with social media, but I was really happy and excited, and I thought it was so funny. I was acting. As the years have gone by, especially since I moved to the States, everywhere I go, I'm the wide-set vagina girl. I'm looking forward to clipping that line out of context from this episode and I <laughs> whenever I get a text from you. <laughs> Despite all that haggling, uh, there was still a quite a bit of line swapping that happened on set, even during filming. One of the great things and luxuries then was to have the best punch-up writer in the business on your set, Waters told Logo in 2014. If a joke wasn't working, I'd be like, Tina, what can we do? She'd say, give me a few minutes and give me five new lines that were all funnier than the last. We'd try out discarded jokes that got lost in production from like two drafts back. And that would sometimes be the thing that worked. And at some point, the title of the film was changed from homeschooled to Mean Girls. Homeschooled isn't as good. Yeah, I think the whole plot about her growing up in, like, Africa with her mother, yeah. who was, what, a zoologist? That was, like, a late addition to the movie. Mark Waters and Lindsay had a prior relationship because he directed Lindsay in the Freaky Friday remake for Disney. And the other hilarious connection that Mark Waters has to this movie is that his brother Daniel wrote Heathers. And Batman Returns. No, what? I didn't... I had no idea there was a connection between those two. Wow. And Mark Waters told Nitrate Online in 2003, the funny thing is, I like to make fun of my brother, saying that it's kind of an easy way out to kill your bullies. It's more interesting if the main character actually has to use more devious means to get back at the Queen Bee, and in doing so becomes the Queen Bee herself. Also, the thing that I really like about this movie in the script form was that it seemed like it had the potential to be a John Hughes movie as well. Like Heather's remade by John Hughes. That's a very good elevator pitch, yeah. Yeah, you can see someone saying that to a Paramount, <laughs> an yeah. Paramount executive and the proverbial cash signs going <laughs> off in their eyes. As you meditate on that, we'll be right back with more Too Much Information after these messages. Casting Mean Girls was a headache pretty much from start to finish. So, Heigl, run us down. Well, when Waters initially gave the script to Lindsay, she told him, I f***ing love Regina George. <laughs> this is exactly the part that I want to play. So he said, we did a read-through, and we were trying to look for somebody to play the role of Katie, but frankly, we didn't find anyone we liked who felt strong enough to go up against Lindsay. And then in the interim, as I mentioned before, Freaky Friday had come out, so Paramount exec Sherry Lansing told Waters, you have to make Lindsay the lead. She can't be the villain in this. And also, presumably, make it PG-13. Lindsay kind of begrudgingly said, okay, I guess I'll play the lead. At least I get to have more lines. <laughs> Apparently, she missed the first day of filming due to having a case of pink eye. I'm guessing the first day was on a Wednesday. Get it? <laughs> Golf swing. Yeah, we gotta we gotta figure out a way to make that a cue. <laughs> Lowen, L uh, Lindsay Lohan sat in on all the auditions. She told Entertainment Weekly. Uh, she said that Amanda Seyfried auditioned to play Regina as well. It ended up being Rachel McAdams, and she's wonderful. Lindsay said McAdams was 24. She was one of the oldest people on the cast, uh, and she auditioned for Katie. And Waters told her point blank that she was too old to play that character. He said, "No one will buy you as an ingenue." Uh, which is like a curiously cruel, old-timey studio head thing to say. Uh, no one will buy you as an ingenue, sweetheart. You're over the hill. I hear that casting for arsenic and old lace down at the public. <laughs> the return of the cigar chomping executive. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, he switched her over once Lindsay changed roles. And McAdams said, this was the script that made me call my manager halfway through and say, I will play any part in this. Tina hit a nerve about girl politics, but in a non-confrontational way. Mark Waters told her to watch Alec Baldwin's scene in Glengarry Glen Ross for That's inspiration incredible. and listen to Courtney Love. And honestly, another perfect, perfect Venn diagram there. The overlap of Alec Baldwin and Glengarry Glen Ross and Courtney Love is Regina George. I mean, I assume it's the always be closing speech. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. it's the only scene he's in the movie. Oh, you're right. Yeah. It's like him, Heath Ledger, and uh, Anthony Hopkins that I think have the records for like shortest screen time per Oscar nomination. The f um, Anne Hathaway and Les Mis, she won 
shortest Oscar, shortest Oscar nominee. Anthony Hopkins was only on there in Silence of the Lambs for like not under for under 25 minutes. That is wild. I can't believe that. That is the shortest crazy. was Spencer Tracy for being nominated for San Francisco. He was in that movie for under 15 minutes. And that was for best leading. Wow. Um, I don't think if there's any other. Oh, Louise Fletcher was nominated for oh, uh, Cuckoo's, Nest. Cuckoo's Nest. She's not in. She's in it for 22 minutes and 37 seconds. Was Nurse Ratched? That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Supporting actor. Oh, I didn't actually don't see Heath Ledger on this list. A lot of these are old timey. Hmm. Interesting. Anyway, apparently that that advice worked. When Lindsay was acting with Rachel, she got very shy because Rachel was older and a very accomplished actress, Mark Waters said. She'd come in the room and not talk to Lindsay. She was very focused. Lindsay kind of got nervous around her, and I thought that, more than anything, was going to be the deciding factor, the fact that she affected Lindsay in that way. McAdams wore a very expensive wig for the film, since her hair was cut short and apparently dyed pink at the time. And Jonathan Bennett, who played Aaron Samuels, added to Entertainment Weekly... Rachel McAdams has the softest lips on the face of the earth that anyone will ever kiss. Hands down. I think I did tell her that. We kissed for the first time on camera, and I was like, whoa. Can you deliver that line again, but just a little closer to the mic? <laughs> a little slower. Can you? Yeah. And I was like, whoa. I should write you a play. You should, <laughs> you should punch in the Keanu Reeves Matrix. Yo. <laughs> whoa. Meanwhile, Mark Waters told EW the person who was neck and neck for the role of Regina and we agonized over which one we were going to cast was Amanda Seyfried. She tested for Regina and was kind of brilliant and very different than Rachel's approach. She played it in a much more ethereal but still kind of scary way. She was more frightening but oddly less intimidating. I can almost see her as being like, I almost like the Daisy character in The Great Gatsby, how like aloof she is kind of makes her terrifying. Yeah, Rachel, uh, uh, Amanda Seyfried has those like terrifying like golem eyes. Yeah. Like, so she could do a lot with just those. I could see that. Uh, it was actually Lauren Michaels who suggested that Seyfried play Karen. So Waters said she came in and read it and nailed it and we got the best of both worlds. And I'm pretty sure Mean Girls was Amanda Seyfried's feature film debut. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because she had just graduated from high school. Yeah, yeah. Casting director Marcy Leroff told Cosmo that they wanted Blake Lively, who hadn't yet done the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. They wanted her for the role of Karen. And uh, I guess she made it to the final screen tests, but didn't get the gig. Marcy Leroff continued, We had a difficult time casting Gretchen Wieners. I kept reading young actresses for the role. Ashley Tinsdale auditioned for the part, but didn't come down to the finals. There was a certain type of desperation for Gretchen that you really felt for her. How do you say this person's name? Lacey Chabert? Lacey Chabert. I How do you know who Lacey Chabert is? She's on Wild Thornberries. She's one of my, she's my second favorite 90s brunette. Wasn't she in Party of Five or? I'm impressed that you know this much about these people. I just had a big crush on her. <laughs> oh. Her and Jennifer and J Lo, J J Lo Hugh. <laughs> I do love how much you love Jennifer Love Hewitt. That warms my heart a lot. Just very pure love. I saw her and still know what she did last summer and, and was stricken. <laughs> my nineties brunette three names heartthrob was Rachel Lee Cook. Mm, she's she's in that. a similar mold. Yeah, I just didn't see that. I don't think I saw movies that she was in as much. I didn't really. I think like I really she. only saw she's all that. Oh, Josie and the Pussycats too. That was oh, yeah. That I wasn't was... a Josie and the Pussycats guy. I know that's a big form. We should do that one. Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised that you weren't. It was like, uh, yeah. Cool, I think it was interesting just interesting like, women with guitars. Yeah, I think it was just like too close to Spice Girls for me. Were you more Spice Girls than Josie? No, I just still had like a bad taste in my mouth <laughs> from just like groups of ten year old girls like accosting me in the playground and screaming "girl power" in my face. Oh. Uh, I was very threatened by uh, women in groups of four. <laughs> Still am, actually. <laughs> it's a powerful number. <laughs> I, I thought there were only three in Josie and the Pussycats. I don't know. I, why do you encourage these bits? I'm making them up as I go along. <laughs> Where the hell are we? Lacey Chabert. Uh, Lacey Chabert, who ended up playing the part of Gretchen Wieners, told EW, I thought I was really wrong for Gretchen. The character description physically was very different from me. She was supposed to be really gangly. I loved how insecure she was. For me, the comedy came in her trying so desperately to please everyone and fit in and having no clue of her own identity. 
I was never the cool kid, she added to the New York Times. I wore Minnie Mouse stuff, and I was growing up in Hollywood. I always felt under a microscope. On the top of a Gretchen Wieners, she was the one constantly trying to make fetch happen. And Tina Fey later said that she wrote fake slang like fetch in the movie to ensure that it didn't sound dated when you watched it back years later. That's clever. I know, it really. <laughs> there was, she says in one of those interviews that she was at the pharmacy once sick picking up a prescription and the pharmacist was like, you don't look very fetch today. <laughs> they all say they get these lines quoted to them like constantly, but I can, in the line of the pharmacist, your pharmacist seems a little rough. Wait, was this Tina Fey or Gretchen Wieners? Uh, that was Lacey Chabert talking about oh it. Oh my God. <laughs> um, to Vulture, Waters dispelled the persistent rumor that Scarlett Johansson auditioned for the film. He said he did test her for something, but not Mean Girls. He tested her for The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, which he was originally attached to direct when Owen Wilson was in the lead. And he said she definitely would have booked that part. Uh, it was eventually made with um, Ben Stiller in the lead. You know, if you can't get Owen Wilson, you get Ben Stiller at that time. And uh, isn't Kristen Wiig is the lead romantic lady in that? I think so. I would have thought the other way around, though. I would have thought that Ben Stiller was uh, more bankable than Owen Wilson at that time. Good question, good question, good question. Mm. Not for us to decide, you know? I think I read that Evan Rachel Wood was also considered for a role in mm. Mean Girls. I'm not sure what one, but I, I imagine it was because of her role in 13. But she passed because she was in a similar movie at the time, the name of which I can't recall because it was not as good as Mean Girls. <laughs> Lizzie Kaplan, who plays Janice Ian, said that she was closer to her own character in high school than probably most of the other people were. She said, she, I had my hair dyed black and was into Charles Bukowski, which <laughs> I would have fallen for her then, too. Uh, for the movie, I wanted to wear tons of layers and dark eye makeup. I cooked my hair, literally burned it with a flat iron to make it stick up straighter. Only now, this interview was in 2014, 10 years later, it has recovered. Uh, Lizzie wanted to play Janice, but we had to make her look more gothic and bizarre than she actually is, Waters told Cosmopolitan UK. Damien, he said, the character of Damien was an unbelievable challenge to cast and we just couldn't find him. Tina and I met Daniel Franzese in New York City and really liked him. He was so funny and had such a great personality, but he came in the room, auditioned, and was terrible. We were going to L.A. to do the read-through and still hadn't cast Damien. We were getting very frustrated. Then Tina and I remembered how funny Daniel was and thought he would be great just to have in the room, even if we didn't give him the part. He came and he brought it. He'd clearly done his homework and was getting huge laughs. By the time it was over, we knew he was our Damien. Franzese said that at this time, he had confided in some parents and friends that he was gay, but he was still largely closeted, and he came out in a public letter that he wrote to his character on the 10th anniversary of the film. He told Cosmo, I came out because I got a letter from a fan who said that when they were in the 8th grade, he was beat up for being chubby and tortured for being a sissy, and then... In ninth grade, the movie came out, and on the first day of school, the popular senior girl said, You're like Damien. Come sit with us. Before that, I was in New Orleans, and a bouncer at a gay bar told me how much peace my character gave him. It took me a long time to realize how impactful it is and how important representation in film is. So those fan interactions are really beautiful, but he had a slightly less nice interaction with Christina Aguilera years later. <laughs> Uh, which, you know, obviously was sad for him because one of the big moments in the movie is when he sings her song, Beautiful. Daniel later told Yahoo, I thought for sure that would be an exciting moment in my life. I was like, Christina, my name's Daniel. I sing Beautiful and Mean Girls. And she was like, never saw it. <laughs> what a great dismissal. <laughs> and then she turned her back and walked away. She was so rude. <laughs> But Daniel's relationship to the film is very powerful. Uh, his letter reads in part, Looking back, it took you, referring to his character Damien, to teach me how to be proud of myself again. It's okay if no one wants to sit at the table with the art freaks. Being a queer artist is one of my favorite things about myself. I've always been different, and that's rad. Perhaps this will help someone else. I had to remind myself that my parents named me Daniel because it means God is my judge. So I'm not afraid anymore of Hollywood, The Closet, or Mean Girls. Thank you for that, Damien. And Daniel talked about how Mean Girls helped him embrace his own sexuality in an interview with my friend Jeff Nelson for People Magazine in 2018. He said, I think part of the reason it took me so long to feel comfortable with who I was was I didn't have the same referential point. 
What Damien did for a lot of queer people and people of size, which I found out later on, it gave them an identity in pop culture where they weren't made fun of. He's never made fun of for being big or for being gay. Jonathan Bennett, who played the love interest Aaron Samuels, told Cosmo, I did a screen test with Lindsay and I made her blush on camera. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I just booked this job. <laughs> but came to find out they hired someone else. Oh, This is true. Mark Waters told Cosmo, the other guy had a great audition, but he came to the table read, sat with his nose in the script, and mumbled the whole way through. Keep that description in mind. Yes, yes, very, very much so. By the time it was over, Lauren came over to me and said, that's a shame. We're going to have to go with that other guy. Jonathan Bennett continued, I was working at Abercrombie and Fitch. I was folding sweaters in the front room. I think I was shirtless and checked my phone on my break. I had a message from my agent saying, call me back right away. You're the lead in the new Paramount movie and you have to go to Canada tomorrow. I was like, cool, I'll call you back after my shift. And he said, you don't have a shift anymore. Go home and start packing. <laughs> I up and quit. Franzese said that James Franco was in consideration for the role, but it is not known if he was the guy who was canned. But again, coming to a read-through and mumbling your way through it with your nose in the script sounds like a Franco move. Yes, Daniel Francesi, who played Damien, told this story in Altitude magazine in 2014. He said that, quote, the other actor hadn't shaved and he didn't take his hat off. He was really playing it cool. People kept coming over to him like, you know, you should really take your hat off. And then right after the table read, he got fired. I don't know about you. That stinks of Franco. Franco! Yeah. While Bennett may not have been the first choice for Aaron, the actor did tell Huffington Post in 2015 that Faye told him at one point he got the gig because he bore a striking resemblance to Faye's former Weekend Update co-anchor and Jordan's personal nemesis, Jimmy Fallon. Boo! <laughs> Folks, if you'll tune into our last episode, was it the last episode? TRL, yeah. Yeah, our last episode for that important piece of Jordan's personal lore. Uh, Jimmy they Fallon stole my date when I was a freshman in college. And she was also a freshman in college, I might add. <laughs> Bennett told Cosmo UK, they spent more time on my hair than they did with some of the girls. The first shot of me in the movie, when you see my character for the first time in that turnaround close-up, I was sent back to hair and makeup for them to do my hair more. The director would say, it's got to be smoother and more buttery. <laughs> Should I say that one closer to the mic? I was going to say, every time I want you to redo a line, I'm going to tell you it's got to be smoother and more buttery. Smoother and more buttery. Oh, ah, it's, in my, it's in my ears. It's in my ears. <laughs> uh, Bennett grew close to Daniel Francisi, who's playing Damien, with Daniel telling Cosmo UK, Jonathan and I had confided in, in each other that we were gay, so we were able to be comfortable. That is adorable. No. And despite the Lauren Michaels Tina Fey connection, the studio was leery about casting too many SNL names. So getting Amy Poehler and Tim Meadows cast as Regina's mom and Principal Duval, respectively, was an uphill battle. And don't forget Anna Gasteyer as Katie's mom, <laughs> yes. Betsy. The studio, quote, had been burned on some Saturday Night Live movies that had come from Lorne, so they didn't want many Saturday Night Live actors and mean girls, Mark Waters told Vulture. How does that make Lorne feel? We can't have too many of your people because they give our movies a bad reputation. <laughs> he said that it might feel like an SNL movie and people might shy away from it. I mean, this is coming after, you know, they Ladies mentioned Man. Ladies Man, Night at the Roxbury. Oh, um, Night at the Roxbury, yeah. Uh, Superstar. Superstar is okay. Yeah. Um, they made the ladies man and they thought Tim Meadows is not a movie star, but I was very adamant about it. I didn't know this. The cast Tim Meadows is wearing in that movie is real. He broke his wrist immediately before they started shooting and was afraid he would have to drop out. And then Faye was just like, well, write in a joke about it. You having carpal tunnel syndrome. <laughs> Amy Poehler was only seven years older than Rachel McAdams at the time. And she could only fly in to shoot for half days because she was still working on SNL. But she contributed a ton to the film, including Kevin Napore's rap. That's an Amy Poehler original rap. Amy coached him on how to do the rap, and she actually gave him some of the moves and choreography for it, Mark Waters told Vulture. The guy who plays Kevin, uh, Rajiv Surendra, was a last-minute casting choice. That character was initially written as Korean, but according to Waters, and this is a quote, we couldn't find an Asian actor in Toronto who was good enough to play him. <sighs> And then this Sri Lankan kid comes in and does it, and we were like, okay, we're going to rewrite it. He's Kevin Napore now. He says he also initially auditioned for the part of Damien, I read. 
Yeah, and he and Rachel McAdams bonded because they were the only uh, Vancouver Vancouver kids there. Eh? Aw. <laughs> I read that an early version of the Mean Girls script had Kevin G as a drug dealer who sold E to his classmates, but then the pills were confiscated by Tina Fey's character, and then when Tina Fey's character gets accused of being a pusher in the burn book, cops come and find Kevin's drugs in her desk, mm. and she almost gets arrested, but then Damien, for some reason, takes the heat. I don't mm. know. I don't I don't like that ending. The first draft idea. Yeah. Polar also ad-libbed the part where her character starts dancing along with the plastics during their jingle bell rock scene, uh, which was an we'll get another scene that was toned down for to get our PG thirteen rating. Uh, and then for the scene where the dog starts uh, going to town on her oh, yeah. on her fake boobs, Rachel McAdams told EW that they pinned a piece of cocktail wiener into uh, <laughs> Amy Poehler's bra. She said, I thought this dog was going to tear her apart. It was very effective. She was such a pro through it. She's trying to do her lines and being so professional, and this dog is chomping on her fake boob. I'll never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, the guy who played the aforementioned Glenn Coco... He apparently wasn't even supposed to be in the film at all. In fact, he emphatically was turned down for it. Actor David Reel told Days Digital, I actually auditioned for a different part in the movie. I didn't get it. What happened was they ended up filming a lot of the school stuff right across the park from my apartment in Toronto. One day I sort of wandered onto the set to see if I could watch some scenes being shot and maybe get some free food. I sort of hung around with the background performers and ended up getting lunch because everybody just assumed I was actually hired to be there. At one point, the director recognized me for my audition and, as a consolation prize, said something like, Hey, I'm going to put you right in the front of this next scene, and you'll have a name and everything. I never signed anything, and so I was never paid, but the free lunch was great. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more Too Much Information in just a moment. Mean Girls was shot in 2003 with Toronto standing in for Evanston, Illinois. I had grown up with all the John Hughes movies, Tina Fey told the Chicago Tribune in 2019. That was American high school to me, the Chicago suburbs. I was living in New York when I wrote the movie, but it never occurred to me to set it there any more than it occurred to me to set it where I was from. She's from outside of Philly. I set it where American high school movies are from. Tina Fey moved to Chicago in 1992, fresh out of college uh, at UVA in Charlottesville. She would stay in Chicago for five years before moving to New York to follow the time-honored Second City to SNL pipeline. Jordan, a quick primer on uh, Second City for people who aren't from the, the century that that was relevant in. I guess it, I guess it's still relevant. <laughs> it's probably still relevant. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's the... Uh comedy incubator of the midwest i mean so many snl superstars went through there i think also steve carell and colbert went through there chris farley went through there uh bill murray and i, I think several of his brothers went through there i believe gilda uh, yeah i mean it's just so many incredible people went through there yeah i went to a show there once it was hilarious really this would have been in like 2004 2005 and I, yeah. College so tours? I, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. College tours. And yeah, I, although I don't, I don't, I don't have like a program or anything, so I can't like see if there were anyone I, I actually know, saw had yeah. gone on to be an SNL, but there's a conceivable chance I, yes. Um, oh, well, with Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, Eugene Levy, Catherine O'Hara, Tim Meadows, Colin Mockery, Ryan Stiles, Mike Myers, Jordan Peele, Amy Poehler, and Tina Fey, Cecily Strong, Eddie Bryant. I mean, these are just, the first names at the very top of the Second City Wikipedia page. It's pretty amazing. Harold Ramis, Gilda Radner, John Candy. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> Tina Fey's first day job when she got to Chicago was the early morning shift at the McGaw YMCA in Evanston. I never set foot in either of the actual high schools, being as I was a childless adult back then, she told the Tribune, but I knew Evanston and I knew the North Shore. Despite that, virtually all of Mean Girls was filmed in and around Toronto. At Toby Coke Collegiate Institute and Etobicoke? Etobicoke? Etobico. Etobico. Yeah, Etobico. Oh, yeah. Far out. 
Etobicoke Collegiate Institute stood in for the girls' high school in exterior scenes. The math competition was filmed inside Convocation Hall at the University of Toronto. In the scene immediately following the competitions, the actors, like Lowen and Tina Fey, are seen standing on King's College Circle with the historic University College in the background. The mall, frequented by characters where Lizzie Kaplan's character works, is Sherway Gardens in Toronto's West End. And there are two Canadian celebrities of the time cameoing in the film, Avril Lavigne and Celine Dion, <laughs> via posters on bedroom walls. So that, that counts, right? I just can't imagine that Celine Dion ever was like poster level fame. Oh, do you not? Oh, yeah, dude. Heart will go on era. Well, no, okay, okay, that's not true. Less about her fame and more of just like the type of personality who was on a poster. Mm, yeah, I guess that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> going into like a like a midwestern like hesher's bedroom and reeking of bong water and right up next to like grand funk and metallica's celine dion it's like the led zeppelin picture of them on the plane and then yeah bob marley and legend yeah what's all the what's all the dorm room the sublime the sublime one the 40 ounces to freedom and then celine dion <laughs> maybe the pulp fiction one what, what are they? <laughs> all the all-time college dorm room poster hits. John Belushi with a sweatshirt that says college on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Celine Dion. <laughs> Dina Fey later told Entertainment Weekly, we all stayed in the same hotel. At the time, I was coming back and forth from SNL a lot from New York. I don't remember if I was weird about flying or if it was the timing, but sometimes I would do SNL, then I would get in a Winnebago at two in the morning and be driven to Toronto. It was so stupid. <laughs> They only had 42 days to shoot this movie on a $22 million budget, which ain't a lot. Director Mark Waters told Cosmo UK, the movie didn't have that auspicious feeling when we started. We were making a movie for a relatively low budget in a studio that was in the middle of making some very high profile, expensive movies. They didn't really pay attention to what we were doing. They were like, okay, great. You guys go off to shoot in Toronto. Shooting was complicated by the fact that its star, Lindsay Lohan, was just 16 at the time and therefore had her hours limited. Wow, I forgot she was that young. Because Lindsay was a minor at the time, we actually had a real struggle finding time to choreograph the talent show dance routine, Mark Waters told DW. We hired a choreographer, and it was going to be a much more elaborate dance. But then, because we couldn't book the time with Lindsay, it ended up being a little more roughshod and a little messier than we were intending. But that ended up being the greatest thing. Absolutely, yeah. Like, it looks like a real lip sync. <laughs> and also, I guess the scene arrived at Jingle Bell Rock uh, kind of as a last-ditch effort. Mark Waters told UW, you'd be surprised how hard it is to license Christmas songs. I don't even know how many things we tried before we got the rights to the Jingle Bell Rock. We were just happy to have anybody say yes. Imagine if it was, like, wonderful Christmas time. <laughs> I mean, it must have been. I mean, I'm sure the number one was all I want for Christmas is you. It must have been. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mariah says no. Mm -hmm. Not until Love Actually. Love Actually came out, I think, like four or five months before Mean Girls. So maybe they oh. went to Mariah and she's like, sorry, just licensed it out. So that could have had something to do with it. Hmm. Um, another scene complicated by Lowen's age was the four-way phone call scene. Uh, Waters told Vulture, Lindsay was still a minor when we shot the movie, so we only had about nine hours of shooting time with her. Um, so he had to shoot all of the actresses separately and composite together um, and achieve that all the, the masterful comic timing of that scene basically through deceit. He said the trick behind it was that I shot everything at 48 frames per second, which is basically a slow motion rate, but we recorded synced sound. So in the editing room, I could play it back at 24 frames per second and have the characters talking like normal. But when then, then when they're listening, if I needed to mess with the time compression, I'd slip into slow motion. Your eye goes to the person who's talking, but for the people who aren't talking, unless they're doing some sort of vigorous activity, you won't notice if it goes into slow motion for a little bit. Isn't that neat? That's really interesting, yeah. Movie magic. Uh, most of the cast were older than Lohan, but not that old. Amanda Seyfried had just graduated high school. Lacey Chabert turned 21 while they were filming. Lizzie Kaplan was 22. Daniel Francesi was one of the oldest at 26. And uh, Jonathan Bennett was 23. Rajiv Surendra was actually younger than Lindsay Lohan. He was 15 years old. But he wasn't the lead, so he obviously didn't have as much to do. Uh, Tina Fey was 33 when she wrote this uh, and in case you wanted to feel bad about what you've accomplished lately. 
Uh, over the years, the one question I'm asked the most is if Lindsay is nice, Rajiv Surendra said. She is and was. She was one of the youngest people on set. She was 16 years old, so had to be tutored, have a chaperone, and had restricted working hours. She was very well respected for being professional and was capable of doing excellent work. This is really interesting to me, and I'm so glad you found this. There were some interviews with the film's wardrobe and costume designer, Mary Jane Fort. She was talking to Nylon in 2014 about her specific vision for the fashion in this film. And she said, I wanted it to be realistic, but also have a timelessness. In costume design, you need to always project a little into the future, because in this case, the movie came out in 2004, but we actually made it in 2003 something I never considered. So we had to be a little ahead of the game and look at a lot of different things. One of the first things you do when you want to go to the future in this country is you go to European fashion and see what they're doing. And then you take those colors and shapes and you try to modify it to fit a contemporary lifestyle. For Mean Girls, we also went back into the world when women and girls actually dressed up to go to school. In the 50s, your nails were done, your hair was done, your dresses were impeccable. So it was a little bit of a combination of the future and the past to give it a contemporary feel. I just think that's really cool. <laughs> Costume designer Mary Jane Fort continued, We read millions of teen magazines and looked through millions of high school yearbooks from all over the country. But real schools are not quite as glossy, and we wanted a little more gloss given the subject matter of the group. And as for the individual plastics personalities, she explained, Regina sort of told everyone else what to do. Within the realm of that, Gretchen was a little more demure and a little sweeter, which we sort of evoked with the cardigan, and Karen was truly the follower. She would do a little bit of either Regina or Gretchen, and they would tell her what to do, and she would do it. When you put Katie into the mix and she begins to surpass Regina, it became really fun. Regina slips into her juicy warm-ups, which, at the time, was kind of couch potato week. <laughs> Lindsay had the most costume changes, she added, probably around 59, but each one of them had over 30 changes. And of course, a lot of them took the clothes home with them after filming wrapped. 59 costume changes. That's wild. Yeah. I, I don't know anywhere else to put this, but uh, I always thought this was funny because I was a big fan of the movie Mortal Kombat <laughs> when I was a kid. And so the arc of the universe returns as it must <laughs> to Mortal Kombat to 1995. Mortal Kombat. Um, the song that plays over the closing credits of both of those movies is uh, Halcyon Plus On and On by Orbital. It's a techno dance song, and because I owned the Mortal Kombat soundtrack... Is it like nine minutes long? Yes, it's incredibly yeah. long. I recognized it instantly when I saw <laughs> Mean Girls and was like, what? And then learning about it, it's not on the film's official soundtrack, which is funny, because um, that's all like very era appropriate like pop and pop punk adjacent stuff but it is one of the most popular soundtrack choices of the era when i started looking at it i found it also appeared in hackers in 1995 oh, wow. which is the the 1995 double whammy of being both in mortal kombat and hackers that is power uh <laughs> and the second film in bam margera's camp kill yourself video series cky2k <laughs> Uh, the song is, oh, womp womp. The song is dedicated to the mother of one half of the production team, Orbital, Paul Hartnall, who was addicted to the tranquilizer Halcyon for many years. So that's fun. <laughs> song I used to put on when I was literally 10, 11 years old and had purchased the Mortal Kombat soundtrack. I think I asked for it for Christmas and received Your it. little one boy rave. Well, it was, it, you know, the funniest thing about that soundtrack, it was like a mix of dance and industrial music and like Napalm Death is on there. So like, I remember put, like going through this soundtrack and it's like, <laughs> and I was like 11 years old listening to Eagle Eye Cherry and Semisonic <laughs> on the radio. And then I would go and play the Mortal Kombat soundtrack and have it go from Napalm Death to this orbital song and just sit in my room and be like, this is music. <laughs> I mean, it's like slightly more up-tempo Enya, really. I yeah. Mean, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on a less fun note, but still sort of fun, the song that Katie's eager to know at the school dance is built this way by Samantha Ronson, who she would later date for a number of years in the late 2000s. That's that's a truly wild connection. Yeah, right. That's pretty good. As you mentioned earlier, Mean Girls opened on April 30th, 2004, debuting at number one at the box office. 
Mark Waters told Cosmo UK, The week before 13 Going on 30 was released with Jennifer Garner, which had a much bigger budget and more of a marketing push behind it, so people thought it was going to crush us. Instead, we crushed them. Which was kind of surprising. We were literally tracking to make 12 million and come second the Friday before we opened, and we were pleased with that because the movie didn't cost a lot to make. But then we opened with 25 million at the box office. It blew everyone's expectations away for sure. I didn't know it was going to be a big movie. The woman who started this whole thing, author Rosalind Wiseman, told the Times. But the first time I saw Rachel in the rough cut, I could not believe how good she was. My mom was with me, and I remember turning to her and saying, I can't believe how perfectly she got every mean girl I've ever worked with. (laughs) Lizzie Kaplan added, I was much more naive about the business back then. I didn't know that much about, say, what a good opening weekend for a teen comedy was. But when I found out they were studying the movie in sociology classes at universities, That felt pretty big. The film has an 84% on Rotten Tomatoes currently. Roger Ebert gave it three out of four stars in his review, writing, In a wasteland of dumb movies about teenagers, Mean Girls is a smart and funny one. Shockingly, it got some bad reviews. Richard Rober called it, quote, only kind of funny and said that he couldn't recommend it. And Anthony Lane of The New Yorker wrote, I would be more amused if the topic of rich material girls had not been worn to a thread elsewhere. Hmm. These people are dumb. (laughs) The movie has been lodged in best of lists of teen comedies and high school movies pretty much since its release, and it's obviously lived longest on the internet and in the hearts and minds of its fans. Every cast member has uh, stories about being confronted with lines from the film while they're out in public, and every Wednesday and October 3rd, you are statistically certain to run into screen grabs or, or gifs of the film on social media. Among Mean Girls' prominent fans in the music world are Mariah Carey, whose 2009 single, Obsessed, begins with an interlude quote where she says, And I was like, why are you so obsessed with me? Which is, of course, a line Regina George says in the movie. Ariana Grande obviously reenacted the film for her video for Thank You Next in 2018. And most recently, British band Wet Leg quotes the film, Is your muffin buttered? Would you like us to assign someone to butter your muffin? In the 2021 song, Chaise Long... <laughs> I have to say that in the French way. <laughs> Chaise longue. That's my fa- I mean, you saying that word, you've said it a few times on this episode, is one, or in this series, is for some reason one of my favorite bits you do. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Mean Girls was ignored by the major award shows, though it picked up Teen Choice Awards for Lindsay Lohan in three categories, and MTV Movie Awards for Lohan, McAdams, and then for all four plastics for the best on-screen team. This brings us to the question of, why no sequels? Tina Fey told Entertainment Weekly, At the time, we did want to start the conversation about the sequel, and for whatever reason, I was like, no, we shouldn't do that. Now I look back and I'm like, why? But now, no, it's too late now. She told Variety in 2018, however, maybe it's better because we can save all the energy for this, with this being the aforementioned Mean Girls musical she wrote with her husband and 30 Rock composer Jeff Richmond, which premiered in Washington, D.C. Why Washington, D.C.? In 2017, before opening on Broadway in April 2018. Nominated for 12 Tony Awards and nine Drama Desk Awards that year, it won Tina Fey an award for Outstanding Book of a Musical at the Ladder. And while there's been no sequel ever made, there has been a film produced bearing the moniker Mean Girls 2. And this made-for-TV sort of sequel aired on ABC Family, which is now Freeform, in 2011, and was a standalone story that actually had nothing to do with the original film, aside from having Tim Meadows reprise his role as the school's principal. This was not well-received. But hope springs eternal, not least in the hearts and minds of the film's stars. Asked by Howard Stern in March 2016, Tina Fey said, In general, I don't know why I didn't just try to do Mean Girls 2. Everyone does sequels. Then in December of that year, Lohan told CNN that she had already written a treatment for a potential sequel. She said, I would love to have Jamie Lee Curtis and Jimmy Fallon in the movie. I've already written a treatment. I just need a response. I know Mark Waters, the director. He'd happily come back. Then in Jan- Lindsay, 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 Jamie Lee was in the other one. It was in the other movie you did. <laughs> oh, no, Lindsay, no, come back. Don't go to Greece. Um, in January 2018, on the Wendy Williams show, Lohan told that host, I've harassed Tina and Lauren so many times, it's becoming a bit stalkerish. I go to SNL when I'm in town. I go to Lauren. I run to Steve Higgins. 
I think they're really focused on the Broadway show right now. A year later in her Howard Stern interview, Loan told him, I think they can't do it right now. I've spoken to Tina, but it can't happen without her and all of the cast. Sometimes you're like, it's just too soon to do it. But it's been 15 years. I remember there being talk of, I think it was Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema doing a spinoff with Jennifer Aniston in the lead back in 2015 hmm. called Mean Moms, which was based on another book by Rosalind Wiseman. But then that got held up in development hell and seems to have died. Uh, maybe Rosalind Wiseman was still pissed about getting burned for Mean Girls and she killed it. I don't know. In April 2020, <laughs> when none of us had anything else on our minds, Loen was once again asked about Mean Girls 2 by David Spade and confessed that she'd been hanging on to the idea of coming back to that project for a really long time, but that it was out of her hands. To work with Tina Fey and the whole crew again and Mark Waters, that was really what I wanted, she said. I was excited to do that, but that's all in their hands, really. I don't know why I'm crashing and burning here. A few days later, Rachel McAdams also expressed interest in reprising her role in a sequel after having declared in previous years that she would be up for it as long as Faye and was on board. She said Tina was our master in chief on this one. So if she's into it, then I'm into it. That's not Rachel. Rachel, that's not a term. <laughs> no, it's master or commander in chief. You can't do both. <laughs> I know they don't have either in Canada, but no. <laughs> Maybe you don't know that. Maybe they have that. That's a position on the Mounties. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. Or in Rush. Um, <laughs> in August of 2022, Daniel Francesi talked on the Behind the Velvet Rope podcast with David Yontef about a potential sequel or reboot. He said, I would absolutely love it, and I would do it in any form whatsoever. I mean, I want to do a whole movie with the whole cast. People would love that, you know? Tina Fey's got that power, and she ain't pulling the trigger. So I don't know who else could do it. But considering the milestone coming up, he continued, I've been trying to write something now that has all of us in it. I think that within a year I could pitch it. And you know, it'll be fun. We're approaching the 20th anniversary. What a great time to start something like that. And a few months later, one of Tina Fey's old SNL buddies made a direct appeal to Tina herself. Asked by Jimmy Fallon <laughs> in November 2022 about Mean Girls 2, Lindsay Lohan answered, I think that's in Tina Fey's hands and Lauren Michaels. And Jimmy turned directly into the camera and said, Tina, I know you're watching. Let's make that happen. Which is the best thing that Jimmy Fallon has ever done or said. <laughs> so Amazingly, he didn't break when he delivered that. Ha! Got him. Uh, so the very last or at least most recent word that I could find about this was for a December 2022 feature in Interview Magazine where Amanda Seyfried and Lindsay Lohan discussed the sequel. Seyfried said, I would kill to do just one week, all of us playing our own roles on Mean Girls on Broadway. She was talking about the musical. Because, she said, Mean Girls 2 is never going to happen, is it? And Lowen responded, I don't know. I heard something about it being a movie musical, and I was like, oh no, we can't do that. It has to be the same tone. Seyfried continued, anyway, Tina is busy. She'll get around to it. So that is the final word for now. There are treatments by Lindsay Lohan and Daniel Francese out there, but everyone says the ball's in your court, Tina Fey. Everyone is game. Well, Mean Girls has obviously resonated with so many because despite its caustic dressing, it has a good heart. And I think, aside from its obvious quotability and instant time capsule vibes, as you say, that's why it's stuck so deeply in the pop culture firmament. Tina Fey told the New York Times, Rosalind wanted the movie to be positive, and I remember promising her that that was the goal, to have a positive core. And damn it, it does. Stephanie Drummond, who played Bethany Bird, the character with the aforementioned wide said vagina, uh, told Cosmo, I remember eating lunch with Tina and Amy as I was one of the only supporting actors on set that day. We had really good conversations. Because Tina had written us, she was so invested in us. It didn't ever feel divisive. I've been on set afterwards that were far more divisive. I still talk to pretty much everyone from Mean Girls. Jonathan Bennett, played Aaron Samuels, told Cosmo. I talked to Lindsay yesterday. I talked to Tina recently. I talked to Lacey and Daniel all the time. Jan Carana, right? Yeah. Help me. That looks good to me. Jan Carana. <laughs> Jan Carana. <laughs> who plays one of the girls referred to as the girls who eat their feelings, told Cosmo UK, I remember being put in that group in the canteen was a little hard because nobody wants to be known as that person. You have to remember you're doing a job. 
But at the same time, it did just make me feel a little bit like, oh, this is what I am right now. Later in the movie, my character calls Regina George a fat ass, which is a bit of a comeuppance for her and a victory for Emma. But the genius of Tina Fey is that later in the film, she basically says, you can't make yourself feel better by making other people feel worse. That is a perfect message. I looked at the earlier canteen scene like, this moment is for a greater good. Because I knew how the movie was going to end, with a message to stop judging women. I was okay. I didn't feel exploited, and nobody ever made me feel bad. May we all, even the meanest queen bee among us, be so lucky. Or at very least, may all of our enemies get struck by a bus when they least expect it. <laughs> Thank you for listening, folks. This has been Too Much Information. I'm Alex Hagel. And I'm Jordan Runtog. We'll catch you next time. Too Much Information was a production of iHeartRadio. The show's executive producers are Noel Brown and Jordan Runtog. The show's supervising producer is Michael Alder June. The show was researched, written, and hosted by Jordan Runtog and Alex Heigl. With original music by Seth Applebaum and the Ghost Funk Orchestra. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. For more podcasts on iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 